Hi, I wanted to do a basic overview of the underlying anatomy and physiology of the cardiovascular system. So I'm just going to do a short little run through of information you should have learned in some way, shape, or form from anatomy and physiology so that we can understand the parts of the heart, uh, which will go together to describe the pathology that we'll be talking about. So in this chapter, I want you to focus on a couple of things. Um, in order to understand the different disorders and typologies, it's important to have a general understanding of the anatomy and physiology of the system. So we're going to go through that, including blood flow, electrical control, and the basic anatomy of the heart and its coverings called the pericardium. In the next lecture, we'll be going through um, EKG information, abnormal rhythms. Uh, there's a fun video that goes along with that to help you remember them. And there's a dance to it. You're going to love it. And <coughs> excuse me, if you understand how the areas connect with one another, you will be very, very good on um, putting together the pathologies and the related signs and symptoms. So with that being said, let's go ahead and get started with the introductory anatomy and physiology. I'm just alerting you as well that there's a lot of links in here. So if you wanted to check out some of the animations, you just have to make sure that you're in the slideshow version and then you click on an open link and it'll take you to um, whatever page is linked to that. So in that, I, whoa, that was intense. So <laughs> what I did was um, just click on that blue link and that will take you to whatever live feed um, that is embedded within the presentation. All right, so normal cardiac function. It's your heart's job to beat. And I don't want you to get really scared about thinking about the cardiovascular system. The heart is just a muscle. It's a muscle that fills with blood and then it empties. And when it's filling, it's relaxed. And when it's empty, it's contracting. It's just muscle. So don't get intimidated. It's okay. <laughs> it's going to fill and it's going to empty. And it has a resting rate, and there's also exercising types of rates. And what's important to understand is normal cardiac function. We would say that an adult, um, a nice healthy heart rate would be about 60 to 80 beats per minute, would be an adequate resting heart rate we'd consider healthy. And during exercise, the heart then has to increase its pumping capabilities. So we've used the term before, exercise intolerance. Exercise intolerance refers to a condition where it's difficult for the heart to make the jump from resting to exercising speeds because the heart has to beat faster and it also has to beat more strongly. So it's pumping about five liters of blood per minute at rest to the 60 to 80 beats per minute range and then has to go up to 25 liters per minute during heavy exercise. And when that's difficult, you will see shortness of breath in um, things that we've talked about in the respiratory chapter. So this dyspnea, this air hunger. All right, anatomically, uh, the heart is located in the thoracic cavity. So it's above the diaphragm. Uh, so everything below the diaphragm, that's the abdominal cavity. Everything above, that's the thoracic cavity. And the area that the heart lies in is called the mediastinum. And if we look at the anatomy of the heart, so the sternum is here, and you can see that the heart is actually shifted over a little bit. It points towards the left hip. And if you look at these pictures, this should be like looking at a patient facing you. So if they were sitting on the examination table, this would be the way that things are oriented. So the heart points down towards the left hip. You'll see that about a third of it is to the right of the sternum and the remaining two thirds is to the left. So it's actually a little bit further down to the left. Also, at the level of the clavicle, so your collarbones, 
that's where you're going to start to see some of these vessels coming out. So when we talk about things like the aorta, that's a lot higher than uh, people have an idea of. So I want you to know that the vessels are up there around the clavicles. There's the subclavian veins and arteries as well underneath the clavicles. And then there are the large arteries and veins that are attaching to the heart. So the typical apex in a healthy heart should be between about the fifth and sixth rib. And in hypertrophy cases, it does shift a little bit in its location and apex. But this is a nice healthy heart, mostly over towards the left, pointing down towards the left hip. And <clears throat> to make room for it, the lungs actually have a notch out of them, the left lung is missing a low when it's also missing some tissue. It's called the cardiac notch and it allows the heart to kind of be cradled by it. So the there's not an insertion, but it makes a little bit of room for the heart to lie over there on the left side. All right. Okay. So we've got the normal heart and the heart is covered by a surrounding sac called the pericardium around the cardiac tissue around the heart. So the pericardium, it's dual layered in the same way the pleura are dual layered. And here's our lungs, and we know the lungs are attached to the diaphragm, and they are attached with the pleural lining. So the pericardium is a very similar lining. It's a nice like serous membrane so that we can keep fluid inside so that the heart can beat in this underwater environment where it's comfortable and it also helps protect it from the external environment. So it does have this association also with the diaphragm and the pleura. So everything is encased in these linings and there's a little bit of fluid in there um, called pleural fluid. And we can take a look at that right here and go through some, uh, some names. So here, what you're looking at, this is the outermost layer, the fibrous layer. And that means it has a high amount of fibrin, so it's a little bit stronger and tougher than the other linings. So this is our outermost coat, and then we have the parietal pericardium, the first layer of the pericardium. And that's a serous lining, which means it's really thin and it's easy for fluid to get in and out of this little lining. And between the next layer of the pericardium, this is called the visceral pericardium over here, which lies on top of the heart itself, there is a little bit of fluid in the pericardial cavity. So there should be a little bit, not too much, and that fluid allows the heart to beat unimpeded. Visceral means inner, as we saw before. So the visceral lining is closer to the innermost areas of the body and it's physically attached to the muscular portion of the heart that we call the myocardium. Myo means muscle. Then, so we've got muscle, and that makes up the majority of the heart, this muscular layer, the myocardium. And the remaining, besides the pericardium, is the endocardial tissue. Endo means inner, endocardium is a smooth tissue, and it makes up the valves of the heart, whereas the septums, the atria, the ventricles, those are all myocardium. They are encased by these two uh, pericardial membranes, the visceral and the parietal, and there should be fluid in between them. And the remaining inside pieces are endocardial tissue. So if we take a look at the myocardium, this is the muscular layers of the heart. So this here's a sagittal section and a coronal section. What we see is really thick muscular tissue. So that's our cardiac muscle. And the cardiac muscle is much larger in the ventricles because that's the area of the heart that needs to beat most hard or forcefully to move blood out of it. And it also is most hypertrophic or trophic in the left side of the ventricles. The right side, it doesn't have a ton to do. It just needs to beat blood to the lungs. So there's always going to be less muscle on the right side. And then when you look at the atria, I want you to notice that there's almost no muscle up there. There's definitely some because we need to have a heartbeat. But to the atria, they have the easiest job in the whole body. Well, for the whole heart. <laughs> when blood comes in through these valves, most of it goes right 
through the atrial openings into the ventricles just by gravity, like force and gravity. When the atria do pump, when they do contract, they just add about one third of the remaining blood that didn't just make its way on its own down to the ventricles. So the atrial linings will always be nice and easy. They're small, it's not super thick. The atria don't have a hard job. Whereas when you're looking at like a coronal section of the heart here, um, we'll see that the right heart, again, thinner muscle, left ventricle, that's very big because that has the hard job. And these muscles, they're anchored together and they have this swirling type of pattern. So if you even think about wringing out a mop or a, I don't know, a wet rag, you twist it in a swirly motion. That is the way that we orient these fibers in the heart so that as they beat, they kind of swirl up in this ringing fashion to fully be able to empty the heart of as much blood as possible for each heartbeat. All right, so here, let's look at the chambers of the heart. Again, there's a right side and there's a left side, and this is color-coded so that you'll remember blood is coming up, deoxygenated blood is coming from the body through these really big veins called the vena cavas. And the vena cavas are bringing this blue deoxygenated blood up to the right side of the heart, into the right atria, it'll go into the right ventricle, and then it'll be pumped out to the lungs and the pulmonary arteries. So I want you to notice that these pulmonary arteries are blue. It's not that because it's an artery it has to be red, it's because it still contains deoxygenated blood. And that blood is going to go to the lungs. And then the lungs, as we saw in the respiratory chapter, we have airflow coming in, and then the oxygen will trade places with carbon dioxide on the red blood cells, on the heme portion, in the iron portion of the heme group, so that we now have oxygenated blood. Then from the lungs, the blood is now oxygenated. So it'll go through the pulmonary veins, and even though veins are usually blue, the pulmonary veins contain 100% oxygenated blood. It's coming right from the lungs. And then it'll go to the left atria, to the left ventricle, and then it's got the hard job. It needs to push that blood up through the aorta, out to the upper extremities, through the carotids, and then down the aorta to the rest of the body. So they each have their own job. The right heart's job is the easy job. It needs to pump blood to the lungs. The left heart, that needs to pump blood out to the rest of the body. So I like to draw hearts like you would in middle school. Let me see if I can get a little shape out here. Uh, just bear with me for a second. There's gotta be a heart. I, there we go, beautiful. I like to draw them like this because when you draw a heart, like that, you'll notice that the bottom is a V, and that will help you remember that those are the ventricles. And then up here, these are the atria. Atria, ventricles. And there is a cross section between them called the septum, just like we have a septum that separates the right and left nostril. And there shouldn't be any communication between the right and left ventricle. The heart is beating, they're both beating at the same time, but they're each doing their own job. One is uh, sending blood to the lungs, and then the other sending blood out to the systemic arteries in the body. Here is a picture with all of the chambers and the vessels. This is not color-coded, it's all the color of cadaver tissue. This is the color of everything down in the gross anatomy lab. So here we have these pieces we just mentioned. Here's the superior vena cava, so that is draining everything above the diaphragm and we have the inferior vena cava, draining everything below the diaphragm. So all that blood is collected, it comes into the right atria, and if you are starting to memorize these pieces, if you haven't already, you definitely need to memorize and not forget what the names of each valves are. So on the right side, there's the tricuspid valve. And as we'll see, it's called that because there are three cusps that you can see when it closes and opens. So there's three little like triangles, essentially, shapes. So they 
are, this is always, or this is open when it's filling. So the tricuspid valve just allows the movement of blood from the right atria into the right ventricle. And only when the ventricles contract do we have a closing of this tricuspid valve. It snaps shut. And that's what makes the first heart sound, lub. So the same thing happens over here, but on the left side, that's the mitral valve. And we'll explain why that is in just a second. It used to be called the bicuspid valve, which was a good name for it because it means two cusps. But when blood is returning from the pulmonary veins um, to, from the lungs, it's going to dump into the left atria, and the valve over here is the mitral valve. So that will be open, and the blood will mostly come down on its own, unimpeded, from the atria to the ventricle. Then when the atria beat a little bit, they'll add that remaining one-third of blood. And when the ventricle's contracting, both sides of the heart are going to contract together, and when these snap shut, when the tricuspid and mitral snap shut, they snap shut during ventricular contraction. They snap closed so that blood doesn't go back up to the atria. You'll see that that is a disorder when the, or the valve leaflets don't close appropriately. That's called a prolapse sometimes, like mitral valve prolapse. And that means the heart has to move blood twice, which isn't efficient. So those, those snap shut when the ventricles contract. There's other valves that we'll mention up here. They're called the semilunar valves, and they have um, good names because they're named for where they're going. There's the pulmonary semilunar valve. You can kind of see in this picture why they call them semilunar. They kind of look like little moons. Those snap shut, and there's ones in the atria too. There's the aortic semilunar, but it's not visible in this picture. But when the ventricles contract, it's forcing blood up to these really big vessels, the aorta and the pulmonary arteries. When that blood gets up there, and now the heart is relaxing, the blood's going to back up a little bit because it's now, you know, dealing with gravity. Some of it's going to move on and some of it's going to be right here. And when it starts to back up, that backing up of the blood is going to be what snaps the, the semilunar valve shut. So that's the second heart sound, the dub. So your lub is the snapping shut of the AV valves and the dub is the snapping shut of the semilunar valves which occurs when there's ventricular relaxation. So contraction for the AV and relaxation snap shut the semilunar. And on the next slide, it's all written out for you. We have, we call them the AV valves because they connect the atria and the ventricles. So atrioventricular valves, AV valves. And as I mentioned, their name for how many cusps they have. So the bicuspid just had two flaps and the tricuspid has three. And when these open, they just look like little triangles. So why do they call this the mitral valve on the left side? Well, a pope's hat is called a mitre. And when the valve opens, it looks like a mitre. And so somebody had the idea that, hey, this looks like a Pope hat. Why don't we call it a mitral valve instead of the anatomically correct bicuspid? And apparently everyone thought that was a great idea. So it's referred to as the mitral valve. So again, make sure you memorize this. On the right side, it's a tricuspid, three cusps. Left side, is the mitral or bicuspid. Why is that important? Remember the right side of the heart doesn't really have a difficult job. It's just pumping blood to the lungs. What that means is the tricuspid valve, you won't see a lot of abnormalities with it in typical disease symptomology. Instead, most of the valve disorders are going to be mitral valve disorders because the left side is the busy side. It's more likely to have an abnormality because it's the one that has higher pressure and it's working harder. So we can see all these valves here. Again, we've got the aortic valve, that's a semilunar, pulmonary valve, semilunar.
They are just named that because of the shape of the cusps. The mitral and tricuspid, those are your atrioventricular valves. They separate the atria from the ventricles and they snap shut to prevent blood from going back up into the ventricles because we want the blood to go out to the lungs or out to the body. So the AV valves prevent backflow to the atria. The semilunar valves, again, they're named for where they're going. They're either the aortic semilunar, and the aorta is the big, great artery coming off of the heart, the largest artery in the body, the highest pressure artery in the body, and the pulmonary valve is leading to the pulmonary arteries, which go out to the lungs. So they're named for where, they're, where the blood is going. When they snap shut, they prevent blood from just dripping back down to the ventricles, which can happen. That means the heart has to move, again, the same blood twice. So instead of beating 60 times a minute, it's going to have to beat 120 times, which is not efficient. So AV separates atria and ventricles, prevents backflow, and semilunar line the great vessels that the heart is conveying blood to. First heart sound, second heart sound. Other things about the valves, they are, first of all, endocardial tissue, we said. They're not myocardium, they're smooth tissue that closes and opens appropriately, hopefully. And then surrounding it, you can see it in this picture, there's a little bit of white surrounding it. That is a nice ring called the annulofibrosi. And the annulofibrosi makes sure these snap shut as tight as possible when they are closed. It prevents backflow and um, call it regurgitation when there's a little bit of blood that comes out of there and doesn't stay where it's supposed to be. Uh, so the annulofibrosi, it encourages good tight closing of the valves. One other thing, we'll see a closer picture of it on the next slide, chordae tendinae. That refers to what people call the heart strings. So let's go to the next slide so I can show you them. The chordae tendinae, those are thick fibrous strings that help anchor those AV valves to the wall. So they help, they can contract because they're associated with muscles called the papillary muscles. And if you took French, you might know that papillon, that was a really bad French accent, papillon refers to a butterfly. So papillary is referring to butterfly like wings, the way that they beat and shake because that's what they look like when you take them out and look at them. They look like a butterfly's wings shaking and contracting. And when papillary muscles contract, they pull down on the chordae tendinae and help um, again, the valves snap shut. Another thing that's important about the chordae tendinae, when there are disease states, these can become shortened, they can become fibrous, they can become damaged. And you'll see that in things that um, scar that area. You'll see that in untreated strep throat, different disorders where there's inflammation and spreading of these illnesses and then you get these um, chordae tendinae shortened and fused and then the valve doesn't open all the way. So we want it to be healthy and we want these to be able to allow the valves to close appropriately and not get in the way of them doing their job. Okay, so you also need to know, uh, and hopefully know by now, that the heart is also an organ, so it needs a blood supply. Where is it gonna get it from? Well. When you look at the aortic valve, so this is an aortic semilunar valve, these two little arrows are pointing to the vessels at the base of the aorta. So when the ventricles beat that blood so that it can go to the aorta and get to the body, some of that blood will be caught in these little openings at the base of the aorta. Those route to the myocardium to supply the heart with its own blood so that it can do its organ jobs. All right, speaking of vessels, there's some that you should know. Hopefully you know already. That would make me really happy if you did. The great veins, these are the things that drain. Veins drain organs, and it's all the veins are eventually leading to the vena cava. The vena cavas are huge. Largest veins in the body, they're called the great veins, and they have the lowest pressure out of any vessel in the body. Normal pressure in the vena cava should be zero. 
If it gets above zero, that's when you have abnormalities. That's when you have venous pooling, venous distension, and lots of trouble. The superior, again, all the blood from above the diaphragm, everything that's drained above the diaphragm will be conveyed through the superior vena cava. Anything lower than the diaphragm will be drained and that blood will be conveyed, conveyed to the inferior vena cava. And the vena cavas converge together to dump all the deoxygenated blood into the right atria to start the process of picking up oxygen in the lungs. And as I mentioned, the largest artery in the body, the highest pressure artery in the body, is the aorta, the great aorta. It looks like a candy cane and it pops off of the, the left side of the heart. It originates from the left ventricle, ventricle, because that's what is holding the oxygenated blood. And all that oxygenated blood needs to be conveyed to the rest of the body. We call it the systemic circulation. So when the left ventricle conveys the oxygenated blood, it's going to come up through the ascending aorta and either go down the descending aorta, which goes all the way down and doesn't make any split until we get to the kidneys at the level of the renal arteries. And when it does that, it makes two really sharp 90 degree turns and that anatomy, that big turn that the blood has to make to go 90 degrees into the kidneys, that is one of the reasons people with high blood pressure have predispositions to kidney damage and damage to the renal arteries. It is a high traffic area and a lot of um, abnormal flow happens there because of that 90 degree turn. So the aorta goes all the way down unimpeded until the renal arteries and then goes and bifurcates down into two eventually. If we don't go down the descending aorta, the blood can go upwards. The big arteries in the neck um, are the carotids. There's right and left carotids. And then we have branching to go underneath the collarbone in the subclavian. So there's a right and left subclavian artery. So aorta, highest pressure, really high up, right by the clavicle, and then the carotids are what spit up to convey blood to the brain. The subclavians will come out underneath the clavicles and deliver blood to places like your arms and the upper trunk. All right, so these are two sides of the heart. They are each doing their own thing. It is a one-way blood flow. So vena cavas, right atrium, right ventricle lungs, back to left atria, left ventricles, out to aorta, and it just happens and it's wonderful. And there shouldn't be any communication between them. Even though they're right next to each other, they don't have any crosstalk. They each do their own thing. So we call that movement, like from the right atria out to the lungs and then back, that's the pulmonary circuit, and that is for gas exchange. Whereas the left heart and going out to the systemic capillaries and stuff, that's your systemic circuit. So there's two circuits, there's pulmonary and systemic, and they're both going all of the time, 60 to 80 times a minute. If you haven't learned your blood flow yet, please know it. I've said it a bunch of times in here. Here it is all written out for you. There's a video embedded in this little heart. You can click on it so that you can watch it. And every time blood makes that entire journey through the heart and makes those two sounds, we would say that's a full cardiac cycle. And that is described here on the next slide, slide 16, the cardiac cycle. Contraction, relaxation. Contraction is called systole. Relaxation is called diastole. So the pressure of the heart, while well, it's contracting, um, or sorry, the, not the pressure of the heart, the pressure of the vessels when the heart's contracting and the pressure of the vessels when um, it's relaxing. That's why there's two numbers in a blood pressure, systolic over diastolic. So your perfect pressure would be 120 over 80. Um, that would be the pressure during systole versus the pressure during diastole. Even though both of the atria and ventricles are contracting at different times, 
when we say systole, we're talking about what the ventricles are doing. They're the part that we really care about. Okay, so here we have a full cardiac cycle all written out for you. Let me see if this little link works here. If it does, that would be pretty cool. Let's see. Our heart is an important component of cardiovascular system. It creates pressure every time it beats. This pressure moves the blood to every cell in our body. Now let us see what is cardiac cycle. The sequence of events in a single heartbeat is known as cardiac cycle. This cycle involves the systole or contraction and diastole or relaxation of atria and ventricles. Look at this figure. In this, you can make out that all the four chambers of heart are in relaxed stage, that is, joint diastole stage. Now you will observe here that bicuspid and the tricuspid walls are open. So what will happen? The blood will flow from the pulmonary vein and vena cava to left and right atrium respectively. Right? Now, the arterial system is initiated when SA node sends out an electric signal. During arterial systole, the atria undergoes a continuous contraction which forcefully passes the blood into the ventricles through tricuspid and the bicuspid walls. Ventricular systole begins when ventricles are filled with blood. The AV node, as shown here, picks up the signal and then conducts it throughout the ventricles. This stimulates the ventricular contraction and as the ventricular contraction increases, the ventricular pressure causes the closure of AV walls. Now this continuous contraction <coughs> causes the further increase in ventricular pressure. What will happen because of this? It will open the semilunar walls and the blood flows into the pulmonary artery and the aorta. Now this closing of AV walls here results in producing the first heart sound lump. Now observe here that ventricles are in relaxed state now. During ventricular diastole, the ventricles relax, arterial pressure falls and blood begins to flow back into the ventricles. This reversal of pressure causes the semilunar walls to shut, producing the second heart sound, dub. So now you know what produces the sound, dub, dub. Meanwhile, the atria have been filling with the blood and as the ventricles relax, blood flows from the atria into the ventricles, forcing the AV walls to open again. Wasn't that beautiful? I really like these too. If you ever want something really quick, oh, she's putting a lime in her eye. I want to know why, but let's not get distracted right now, okay, guys? So I really like the crash courses. Um, for extra information on topics. So that is, I needed a break talking, that was the cardiac cycle. So here, like was just described, there's the first state, so atria are relaxing, they're filling, whatever something is filling, it should be relaxed. Then, um, whoops, down here, uh, once most of the blood has gone through. Again, remember, two-thirds of the blood makes its way from the atria to the ventricles unimpeded, just through these open <coughs> AV valves, the mitral and the tricuspid. Okay, where it says bicuspid here, how nice. And then the atria contract and add just that tiny little extra one-third of blood so that the ventricles are totally filled, hopefully. And so now the ventricles are filled and the atria can chill. They could go back to relaxing. And now the ventricles, because they're filled, they need to contract. So they contract. And remember when they contract, that is when the AV valve snaps shut so that blood doesn't go back up into the atria. Instead, the blood's gonna go through the semilunar valves up into the aorta and the pulmonary arteries and when the heart and ventricles finally start to relax in diastole, 
that backflow of blood, you can see it here in this little, uh, you know, arrow, the little backflow of blood is going to be what, no, never mind, they didn't do that correctly. I'm looking at something else. But anyways, <laughs> the backflow over here is going to be what snaps the semi-lunar valve shut, and that's your second heart sound. So, one cardiac cycle. Atria contract, ventricles contract. While well, one's contracting, the other one's relaxing. So they're gonna take turns. Atria, ventricles, atria, ventricles, atria fill the ventricles, ventricles deliver the blood. All right, so we use a term to measure cardiac output, um, which takes into account two things. The first is called stroke volume, and the second is heart rate. So we already said heart rate, a normal, um, healthy adult, it should be about 60 to 80 beats per minute in normal circumstances at, excuse me, at rest. So we know that, the heart rate, and you can take your own heart rate and figure out what it is. If you just count, you can count for a minute or you can count for 10 seconds and then multiply it by six to get your heart rate. <clears throat> then we have stroke volume. And stroke volume is how much blood leaves the ventricle each time the heart beats. A typical stroke volume, we would say, um, is three tablespoons or 15 milliliters. So if the heart rate is, let's make it, um, if it's 80 beats per minute, it would be your cardiac output would be 15 mils times 80 beats per minute, and that would give you cardiac output. The reason I say that we usually figure that out um, just using known numbers is there's one way to determine this in the lab, in the hospital, and that's by catheterizing the heart. You don't want to cath everybody's heart that is quite invasive. It does have some complications associated with it. So we generally use um, common like standards for stroke volume, but all that taken together is cardiac output. So that's a term we use a lot, cardiac output. So it's a measure of how well the heart's working, how often it's working, and how much blood is being delivered to the body. All right, a couple of other things go along with that that are important. The first is just how hard the heart can contract. So everybody's heart has its own ability to contract. Um, it does have a little bit of that elastic band principle where you stretch it and there's the ability of it to snap back. So the heart does have to be adequately stretched when it's filling. And that's called the preload, which is a weird word. But what preload is saying is how much blood stretches the ventricle. And if there's a lot of blood in there, then the ventricle is really stretched, it just like snapping a rubber band. If you pull the rubber band really hard apart and let it go, it's going to snap really tightly with a lot of strength. So there's going to be a lot of contractility. If there's a really low preload, like you'll see different types of heart disease, like congestive heart failure, their preload is really low. They have a lot of venous backup. There's a lot of edema. There's a lot of pooling of blood in the venous system. So there's not as much blood to stretch the ventricle. So that's kind of like taking a rubber band and just kind of like halfway stretching it and then letting it snap. So it doesn't have as much force. <clears throat> so we'll look at that in a little bit. There's a law for that, um, but it's basically based on a rubber band. <laughs> You stretch it, and the harder you stretch it, uh, the harder it snaps. So the preload is referring to how much blood is there to stretch the ventricle. The other thing that helps determine cardiac output is the afterload. And this is trying to be helpful with these um, arrows here. The afterload is the pressure from the aorta. So it's like the systemic pressure of all the blood in the body and all the vessels in the body that oppose blood leaving. So what that means is in cases of atherosclerosis or other types of just hypertension, high blood pressure, there's a high amount of resistance in vessels in the body. So it's harder to get blood through them. 
So the afterload is the opposing pressure in the aorta. So if somebody has a high afterload, even if they have a great preload that's stretched the heart and the heart's ready to go, the afterload can still overcome that initial preload pressure. So afterload's opposing pressure in the aorta, and preload is the initial stretch in the ventricles. Okay, I hope that made sense. Uh, those are two important concepts. So cardiac output, stroke volume times heart rate. Some other things that you should know are ejection fraction. Ejection fraction is stroke volume over end diastolic volume. So every little piece of blood that gets into the ventricle isn't necessarily going to be empty. And that's okay. In nice, healthy hearts, there's always going to be a little bit of blood left over after the ventricles contract. So think about this. Um, I like to use a lotion bottle example, and you want to put the lotion on its skin. So you take a little pump out of the lotion, and it's in your hand now. So that lotion in your hand, that would be the stroke volume. All of the blood left over um, would be the end systolic volume, what's left after contraction. The end diastolic volume is the full amount of blood that's filled the ventricle. So before the heart beats, at the end of diastole or relaxation, end diastolic volume. So stroke volume is end diastolic volume. So everything that was in the ventricle minus end systolic volume. So what left, all right? So, okay, I feel like I'm confusing myself even. All right, so again, the lotion bottle, before you pump any lotion out, all that lotion in there, that's your end diastolic volume. It's just resting and it's how much is in there. Then you pump some lotion. That's lotion in your hand, that's the stroke volume. Everything that's left over in the lotion bottle would be end systolic volume. Does that make sense? Okay, good, I hope. So ejection fraction, cis or stroke volume divided by end diastolic volume. So this is a figurative way, or you could do an actual way to do this by catheterizing the heart that will figure out the percent of blood pumped from a filled ventricle. We, so I said about three tablespoons of blood is what a typical stroke volume is. That would mean a typical end diastolic volume is about five tablespoons. So end systolic volume would be like two tablespoons, right? But when somebody has a weak or failing heart, you'll see that their stroke volume is very low. The lower your stroke volume, the more venous backup, the bigger problems you have. Alrighty. So I mentioned there is a law about stroke volume. It is called the Frank Starling Law of the Heart. There's very few laws in science and medicine, so when you come across one, you should pay attention to it. Frank Starling is what I mentioned with preload. It is a preload measure, and all it states is that when you have adequate stretching of the heart muscle, of the myocardium, the little molecular things that allow a heart to beat, actin and myosin, they let muscle contract because they have to create these cross bridges and the filaments have to slide. And when you do the right amount of stretch, the actin and myosin are perfectly set up to contract hard and get a good force. The more stretching you have, just like with that rubber band, the more stretch, greater stroke volume. So the greater the preload, greater the stroke volume. If the preload is too great over time, if the heart is continually overfilled, so constant high amount of a preload, that heart can be overstretched in the same way that a rubber band can be overstretched. That is something we'll talk about called high output heart failure. The heart worked too hard for too long. When there's inadequate stretching, there will be poor force of contraction, stroke volume goes down,
and then you have a high pressure in the body and um, venous backup. That is essentially the entire disorder of congestive heart failure. Blood pools in the body, which we call congestion. In the same way that traffic is congested when there's too many cars, fluid becomes congested when there's not a good preload and we get venous backup. Okay, couple more things. Um, electrical conduction system. Electrical conduction, um, this is controlled by the nodes of the heart. There are two nodes. One of them is the pacemaker node. And you might know that a normal heart rhythm is called a sinus rhythm, a normal rhythm. So we call the node that generates that rhythm the sinoatrial node. It's the pacemaker. And the SA node receives direct input from the autonomic nervous system. Most of this information comes from the vagus nerve and then it stimulates the heart to beat. <clears throat> All right, so most of the innervation of the hollow visceral organs, including the heart, will be derived from the vagus nerve. So the vagus will be sending out some um, efferent nerves, we'll take a look at that, to set our resting temperature, resting heart rate. And that will be received by the sinoatrial node. And when we are looking at these nodes, they're made out of the same endocardial tissue that the valves are. So they're going to respond a little bit differently than myocardial tissue um, in the way that they're excited. But these different nodes, they form this nice nervous plexus to spread and send information to the cells of the myocardium and allow them to become excited or depolarize so that they can contract. So the SA node, that's receiving the information from the nervous system about what the heart rate should be. So that's your pacemaker, the SA node. Then we have the atrioventricular node, AV node, so after the SA node becomes stimulated from some sort of nervous activity, there's going to be a wave of excitation that's going to spread across the atria and eventually get, well, quickly, not eventually, it will spread down too to the atrioventricular node or the AV node. And that helps regulate the communication between the atria and the ventricles. So we're gonna have this wave of excitation across the atria, they're gonna start getting excited to contract and then we will have that spread to the AV node. And then the AV node takes that excitation, this it's time to turn on and contract information, and starts to spread it down. And it goes first to the AV bundle, atrioventricular bundle, which has an eponymous name, the bundle of his, which was an individual who discovered this, and people love to name things after themselves, but I like to call it the AV bundle because that's the name of it anatomically. So AV node to AV bundle, and then it splits into two bundle branches, the left and the right. And then these branches will go all the way down the septum of the heart, and then they scoop up at the bottom and start coming up to the top of the ventricles. So you can imagine, so the atria contract, and then this wave of contraction, it's going to start pretty much at the bottom and then squeeze up towards the middle to fully empty the heart to the best of its ability of blood. Kind of like when um, you're almost at the end of toothpaste and you have to start going to the bottom and squeezing it all the way to the top to get the toothpaste out, that's the way that your heart's going to work going to start contracting down here and then get to the middle to empty. All right, so those little pieces, we call them AV fibers, or you can call them after the guy who named them after himself, Purkinje fibers. So we're going SA node, AV node, bundle of his, her AV bundle, left and right bundle branches to the Purkinje fibers, and this is just the little highway that essentially is going to connect to all of the cardiac cells so that they can start contracting, almost like doing the wave. One person starts it, that would be the SA node, 
then it spreads throughout the stadium just because of that one dude. All right, so here it is all written out for you, SA node, AV node, and then there's a full conduction pathway. You can check out that video if you want to watch this happen, but these are your connecting pieces and you see them again on the next slide, SA, AV, spreading down to the branches and then coming out to the Purkinje fibers. So the SA node is receiving the information from the nervous system. And that information will be integrated by a couple of different factors. The main controller of heart stuff, cardiovascular things, is the medulla. The medulla oblongata, very low in your brain. The lower you are in the brain, the more important that is to survival. It receives input from the different receptors in the body and then sends out information to the autonomic nervous system, so sympathetic or parasympathetic. And those different sensory things would be the chemoreceptors that sense changes in pH. As we went over last time, pH is important because CO2 is an acid. So information about CO2, whether or not we need to increase the heart rate, increase respiratory rate, all those things are sensed by the chemoreceptors sampling from the pH and getting information about pressures of CO2 and oxygen. There's also pressure receptors, baroreceptors. So those align um, a lot of vessels, but they're highest in the carotid arch and the aortic arch, and they signal to the medulla when there's changes in pressure. So if the pressure starts to fall, we're going to need to speed up the heart rate. So the baroreceptors are important in sending messages, and then the chemoreceptors are about speeding down or speeding up or slowing down the heart. All right, so I mentioned the nervous system is going to be sending out messages. The resting heart rate, as enacted by the sinoatrial node, is under the parasympathetic nervous system control. And parasympathetic is rest and digest, so you're not exercising, you're not doing anything crazy, you're just sitting and having a normal heart rate. So that's running all the time. And that is sending out information through the vagus nerve, which throughout its various iterations is going to release acetylcholine. We'll see that on the next slide too. And that acetylcholine binds to receptors on the surface of the heart called muscarinic type 2 receptors. As I mentioned in class last week, if it's an even number next to a receptor, it's going to be an inhibitory receptor. That means the cell will not do what its action is. So these are muscle cells. A muscarinic type 2 receptor is going to encourage cells to not contract, to not send a message. So we're just going to have simple slowing down of the heart rate if we have to turn on parasympathetic. Acetylcholine binds, muscarinic type 2, slows down the heart rate, slows down the force of contraction. In sympathetic outflow, so let's say we now want to exercise or we want to run away from a bear. That's your sympathetic fight or flight system. That is associated with nerves that branch off from the T1 down to the L2 region and spread out to the sympathetic ganglia which receives acetylcholine, but in turn sends out norepinephrine efferents. And norepinephrine binds to alpha and beta receptors and does things like encourage your heart rate to go up, encourage your heart to contract more strongly. The predominant receptor type on the myocardium is the beta-1 receptor, and it's an odd number, so we know it's excitatory. That uh, receptor when stimulated is going to encourage those cells to do more of their job. So the muscle cells will contract more strongly. The heart rate will go up when there's norepinephrine. So when you're exercising on a treadmill, you have norepinephrine bouncing around in your body. It's going to help, or help um, raise your heart rate, raise your blood pressure, and it's also going to make some alterations to your oxygen flow. We're going to get good um, relaxation of the bronchi when there are drugs or norepinephrine circulating to allow airflow.
All right, so hopefully you remember that stuff from anatomy and physiology. This is a slide showing you uh, what is released from those different nerves. So we were talking about parasympathetic. Again, the tissue receptors for parasympathetic are called muscarinic receptors. And depending upon um, even or odd, it will be excitatory or inhibitory, but parasympathetic, whenever you stimulate it, so let's say you're done working out now, you're off the treadmill and now it's time to chill, your parasympathetic has to be turned on, that acetylcholine is gonna go to the nodes and stimulate the nodes to slow down. During the exercise, the norepinephrine would be binding to alpha and beta receptors and helping to do things like raise your heart rate because the heart has beta-1 receptors on it, so it contracts more strongly. Um, also, it'll do things like increase airflow by binding to beta-2 receptors on the bronchi, allowing relaxation instead of contraction. Whew, lots to learn, right? Yes. So here we have epinephrine, which is which means um, it's epinephrine or norepinephrine with an R group on it. That's why we use norepinephrine, no R. Epinephrine and norepinephrine do the same things in your body. They can bind to the same receptors. And whenever there's epinephrine around, it stimulates the beta receptors, increases contractility, increases conduction speeds of excitation through the ventricles. So if somebody was going into cardiac arrest, if their heart stops, if they have a low heart rate, you can give them epinephrine to stimulate contraction. You also give epinephrine when somebody's in respiratory distress because of the activity of the beta-2 receptors. Okay, so I said preload increases strength of contraction. The other thing that directly increases strength of contraction is calcium. Calcium is extremely important in the firing of cells. Your heart cells, or really any muscle cells, can't contract, but heart cells need calcium to beat. Very important. When you have high calcium in the body, you'll see erratic firing of cardiac cells. So it's actually recommended that individuals who are not deficient in calcium not take a calcium supplement. It has such a strong um, impact on cardiovascular activity. And then there's potassium, um, which I'll go over in the action potential stuff and hopefully it'll make some sense. High potassium, again, irregular firing, abnormal rhythms. Low potassium is delays in cardiac cell firing, low heart rate, low blood pressure, bad cardiac output. And that should all make sense once we review the action potential which I hope you enjoy. That'll be in the next lecture. All right, everybody, that is what you need to know about the anatomy and physiology of the cardiovascular system before we get into the pathology. Enjoy.